John Roberts is the most successful Republican politician of the last 25 years. Brilliant. He is hardly an institutionalist centrist calling balls and strikes. He's calling balls and strikes like Leslie Nielsen did in The Naked Gun. <laughs> the, the, the pitch is halfway down the plate and he's called yeah. the ball or the strike based on which side wins. Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Andrew O'Hare, executive editor at Salon. It is my great pleasure to welcome today, officially my former boss, um, former editor-in-chief of Salon, that's kind of a footnote here, and best-selling author, David Daly, welcome. Pleasure to be back home, thank you. It, it's a great to have you here. We're gonna talk about your new book, which is perfectly timed for this incredibly contentious election. It is called Anti-Democratic. A title we can say this time. Yes, we can say that. Yes, yes. Dave's first book, a bestseller, uh, uh, are we gonna say the title? I think we, I think- Up to I, you. I think we are and- I'm video, not in charge the video, here anymore. The video team will decide. <laughs> what to, Dave, Dave's first book, Rat Fucked, which was a national bestseller, is in many ways a precursor to this one. This goes into more detail. Let's read the subtitle, which is Inside the Far Right's 50-Year Plot to Control American Elections. We'll get into the details of this, uh, Dave, but first of all, we've got an election coming up. You might have noticed that. I assume that you're, you know, I, I, I do know you pretty well. I have a pretty good sense of where you fall on the ideological spectrum. I assume you agree with the general, you know, premise that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz have changed the dynamics of this election a lot. But have they changed it enough to uh, address the kinds of issues that you talk about in this book? I think that is the $100,000 question as we head into this election season. This is going to be a very tight and very close election. And as we know, the Electoral College is really what matters and in 2020, we're talking about essentially 45,000 votes in three very competitive states that made the difference. Uh, even though Joe Biden won the popular vote by 7 million, right. it was those 45,000 votes that made the difference. And the kinds of litigation that we saw after 2020 was kind of a clown show. It was Rudy Giuliani in front of Four Seasons Landscaping. It was Akita Mitchell and a bit of a, you know, a pile up. That's not going to be the case this time. I think they're better prepared. I think there's better lawyers working on this. Laura Trump uh, at the RNC has already said that there's about 75 to 90 cases that the RNC is involved in, either as a litigant or filing amicus briefs in about 24 states. These involve some of the big white shoe conservative law firms, mm -hmm. Consovoy and McCarthy and others in DC. Uh, Rudy Giuliani is not involved. And so what I worry about um, is another replay of Bush versus Gore in, in 2000. If the margin is anywhere near as close as it was in 2000, when we're talking about, what, 550 votes maybe. In a state that was absolutely literally state, the tipping point, yeah. Absolute tipping point. We are going to see a six-week period I would imagine, no matter what, between election day and the meeting of the Electoral College in mid-December, that is going to be like a second election period, except 180 million of us will vote on election day, and if this winds up before the Supreme Court the same way Bush versus Gore does, and there's a million different scenarios you could mm -hmm. conjure up that gets it there. You will have nine people making that decision, six of which have essentially been appointed or, or trained or in the pocket of Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society in some way. Which is something we'll talk about in a minute, yeah. Three of whom worked on Bush versus Gore as Which is amazing, lawyers. that's just amazing, and yeah. Who were those three? Uh, those are John Roberts and Justice uh, Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett, yeah. who essentially proved their conservative bona fides in that moment, and they were fast-tracked to uh, be trusted by the conservative legal movement for these incredibly important spots on the court. I mean, Bush versus Gore, in many ways, was the proof of concept uh, for controlling the court and controlling American elections. And I, I, I think that one of the things that's really important about this book is that you're making the point repeatedly by using the expression, you know, 50 year plot to control American elections, that for understandable reasons, people are focused on the proximate threat of Donald Trump, who is a proximate threat. And, but 
the Trump administration, as you just said, was in many respects a clown show. There were a lot of amateurs in the House. And when you have somebody like Rudy Giuliani or, or Cleta Mitchell or what's her name, Sidney Powell, right. you know, involved, it's all going to go south on you because those people were not competent, not well informed, um, not good with the law. And what, a lot of what your book is about is a lot of people who are competent, yes. are well informed, are intelligent, and are good with the law have been involved for decades in building for a moment like this, right? I think that's exactly right. A lot of people believe that this uh, current anti-democratic moment began when Donald Trump descended the gilded elevator at Trump Tower. And actually, you can trace the, the roots of this moment back you know, decades earlier than that. The folks who have been plotting the conservative legal movement um, and this uh, truly anti-democratic moment of entrenched minority rule in so much of our politics have been planning for this for a long time. You can track it back many decades, as I try to do in this book, um, and there's a, a really good reason for it. They were, and are still to this day, trying to achieve political policy goals that majorities of Americans disagree with. And the only way to pull this off was by capturing the courts. And they learned mm -hmm. this time and time again over this entire period, um, which inspired and egged them on to sort of go further into this idea. You don't need 218 members of the House and 51 members of the Senate right. or the White House if you can put five people who you know and trust in lifelong, unelected, unaccountable positions on the U.S. Supreme Court. Even better if you have six. Even <laughs> better if you have six. And uh, I think one of, the, one of the key points here in talking, talking about this as, as a 50-year plot, there are lots of legal cases that you discuss, but we can focus on the two headline-making cases that are, to some extent, the centerpiece. And most of our viewers will have at least heard of these cases, uh, one of them being the Citizens United case that had basically opened the door to unlimited corporate dark money in the political process. The other one being Shelby County versus Holder, that being Attorney General Eric Holder, which um, did not literally undo the Voting Rights Act, but removed its teeth. And you discussed some of the very specific ways that it allowed southern states and potentially other states as well to uh, gerrymander, disenfranchise uh, uh, poor people, black people, uh, people who are likely to vote Democratic. But those two court decisions, as famous as they were, weren't just the result of you know, some conservative principles coming to the fore, um, a new interpretation of the Constitution from some of these people, um, or some sort of compromise position, your argument is this was literally the culmination of decades of strategy. Yes. What the conservative legal movement has built in many ways is a hermetically sealed circle. When they bring these cases, they have the Federalist Society doing the research and creating the sort of legal hothouse theories that make up the amicus briefs that they also fund. They fund the litigators uh, and the expensive law firms. They fund the um, astroturfed nonprofits that go out and sure. find the litigants that bring these cases, and they are serving as essentially the one-stop shopping transmission belt for installing the judges who will hear these cases. And then the same funders oftentimes are, are behind things like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Which writes bills for That yeah. then take the cases once they're allowed to gerrymander or pass voter ID bills and bring them back down to the state legislatures and enact them in, in all of these places. So what you begin to see is that the fix is in at just about every single level, and that's certainly the case in Citizens United and also in Shelby County. You, you, you make a very persuasive case that uh, essentially the right built a movement. Um, it isn't a grassroots movement, but it, is, it can be called a movement over a period of, of decades uh, to achieve these results. 